welcome everyone. Um, we're going to interview Ayan Hirshiali. Born in Somalia, Ayan Hirshiali moved to Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, and Kenya while she was still a minor to eventually seek asylum in the Netherlands. Having received her protection status, it only took her a few years to fight her way to Leiden University, where she studied political sciences. She eventually became a member of the parliament for a liberal conservative party, VVD, to fight for Muslim women's rights based on her own experiences. Nowadays, Ms. Hirsi Ali lives in the United States and works for the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. She also founded the AHA Foundation, which among other things aims to protect the rights to speak freely and critically about Islam. Ms. Hirsi Ali, welcome to Room for Discussion. Thank you for being here. Um, now, it was actually really difficult to come up with uh, the shortest possible summary of your past, which Lois just aimed to do. Uh, so we would like to elaborate a bit more on that. So you grew up in four different countries with also completely different cultures, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, and Kenya. How did you constantly adapt to these new situations? Well, I had no choice. Uh, it's my father who took us from one country to the next and you know, in each country, you had to adapt, you had to learn the new language and the new customs and norms. And uh, I remember thinking once we got used to one place, then we were moved to the next place. So I think we were caught, you know, kept in a, a constant um, rhythm, constant exercise of adaptation. Uh, and for me, when I came to the Netherlands, I had been, I, I was so used to adapting that uh, I didn't find, it was difficult, but I didn't find it that difficult. What was actually the hardest for you to adapt to them? What specific situation or even? In the Netherlands, it was the cold. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I just couldn't get used to the weather. Uh, and I still have, uh, wherever I go, I still have this issue of complaining about being cold. Uh, but other than that, I love the people, I love the country, and uh, I still do. Um, in your autobiography, you describe some very intense um, experiences throughout your childhood. What would you, which experience do you think had the most impact on your life? I think I would qualify it as intense only if you grew up in, you know, wealthy liberal Western societies like the Netherlands. Uh, if you if you were growing up in Africa or the Middle East or South Asia. Or, uh, you know, any other part of the world that's not developed, my experiences would actually not be rated as intense. Uh, I'd say the most consequential uh, experience for me was uh, being sent to school as a girl. So going to school, learning how to read and write, and then discovering the world through books and other media, uh, that's had the biggest positive impact on my life. Now, in um, 1992, you arrived in the Netherlands. You already said that the call was quite, uh, quite bad for you. Uh, but you received the asylum status quite fast, uh, within a couple of weeks or like at least within a couple of months. And in your book, you start portraying your fellow Somali asylum seekers as, quote, people that always sat together in the asylum seeker center, chewing gut and discussing how terrible the Netherlands was. Yeah. Um, so why do you think didn't these people integrate properly? Well, I think you touched on it the first time with your first question. Uh, maybe I adapted so quickly because I was used to adapting to new environments and they weren't. That could be one possible uh, explanation. Um, for them, the norms, the customs, the values, the, the language, everything seemed to be incredibly difficult. And so this huddling together of individuals who thought of themselves as enemies before they came to Holland. But once they were in Holland, then, you know, they, they felt like they were Somalis together and they were under the same circumstances. They didn't understand what was going on. They were uprooted from their homes, uh, from their wealth. Many of them were uh, led comfortable lives back in Somalia. And now they were, uh, they had the status of an asylum seeker center. You know, they were being handed an allowance of, I think back then it was 20 guilders a week. I think people thought, uh, they, they felt traumatized by all of that. And they responded to that trauma by shutting themselves off and cocooning themselves off from the rest of society, which is a pity, but it's also, uh, it's not unusual. Do you think then that 
this is also responsibility for the, the Dutch state in this circumstance, or maybe like a different state if it happened in different countries, but in this circumstance, in this uh, specific situation, is it the responsibility for the Dutch state to do more about it? And if so, what should they do about it? Well, this is back in 1992, so it's a long time ago. And I think uh, the Dutch society and the Dutch government have over the years learned quite a bit and so have obviously uh, asylum seekers, whether they've been there for 20, 30 years or whether they are uh, thinking of coming now. I think there's now uh, a realism around the issue of integration or assimilation. If you put people in a compound and you feed them, you give them shelter, but you deny them jobs and you deny them, you know, uh, a meaningful way of thinking about their future, then you're basically creating an underclass. Uh, and that underclass, you may, as a society, think, well, if they don't qualify for asylum, we're going to deport them. But if you look at the deportation numbers, they really are very small. And so you have people who either are granted asylum and have very difficulty adapting or you have people who are not granted asylum and are living in this limbo land and that's not good for them and it's also not good for the host society. You would like to jump in a bit more um, into your experiences with the Dutch immigration services because <clears throat> during your years as a student you um, actually worked for the Dutch immigration and naturalization service as a Somali Dutch interpreter. Yeah. Do you think this uh, work affected your views on Islam and, and mainly also feminism within Islam? I wouldn't say it was particularly the immigration services. I also worked as an interpreter for other services, social services. I worked for um, in, in the healthcare industry, you know, a broad range, almost everyone who is involved in the life, every institution and that somehow uh, gets involved in the life of asylum seekers. I translated in courts and prisons, for instance. And all of this, yes, uh, it did influence me uh, fast because uh, the more I translated for these institutions, the more I was educated myself on how these institutions actually function, how the welfare state functions, aside from you know the theory that I was getting uh, at the university. And you know, it, the more it became apparent to me that you were expected in the Netherlands to live as an individual and that individuals, men and women, are, are equal and are seen as equal, uh, then obviously, yes, that, that affected my way of thinking about the uh, Somali clients that I was translating for and the desperate situation that they were in. And some of these rigid cultural norms uh, that were justified in the name of Islam, keeping girls at home, removing them from school, uh, subjecting them to honor violence, uh, subjecting them to female genital mutilation, all of these things over time. Yes, I did come uh, not only to observe, but also to judge them as negative uh, and a violation of the human rights of the girls and women involved. But apart from, from learning from uh, the services that you worked for, you also became a bit critical uh, of the IND, uh, yes. mainly their marginalizing practices within the asylum process. Some people might find this a bit unconventional since you're critical of both the immigration office, but also the asylum seekers that, that are within them. How would you explain this? So my role as, as an interpreter was really just to make communication between the bureaucracy, uh, the immigration and naturalization services, and uh, the asylum seeker or the refugee. And so in that sense, my, my role is very, was very neutral, um, but also for me, very pragmatic because it was my biggest source of income. Um, so you, you, can see, you can think of it in a more pragmatic way at that stage in my life. The criticism I had wasn't really the bureaucracy was doing what it was told to do by the law and they are not the legislators they simply execute the law but the idea that you could have people come in and put them on these compounds called as, uh, asylum seeker centers and leave them there in limbo uh, that I, I was very critical of that I was also very critical of and that's not necessarily a criticism of uh, the immigration naturalization services 
it's, it's of it, it's the philosophy of the government. Uh, and then also when I was in parliament, we had these discussions uh, endlessly. It was about what does it mean to integrate into Dutch society? What should we be demanding of the people who come in? Uh, what kinds of resources should the government spend? But what do you expect in return? And those questions were not always answered in a, in a way that worked, uh, I would say. And that's why we still have larger numbers of people who are unassimilated. Now, this is also in a period, um, especially after you arrived in the, in the Netherlands, until you started to become a member of parliament, let's say, where you became much more critical on Islam itself. Um, and this also led to one of the most striking events in your life, namely, namely the murder on Theo van Gogh, um, who helped you make an Islam critical documentary submission. And the same murderer also left a death threat uh, on your address. So has this event changed the way in which you voice your opinions and thoughts? Um. The events have only seemed to affirm the proposition I was making right after 9-11, that some of these problems um, that we were seeing, the rejection of Western society, the rejection of the equality of men and women, um, this idea of holy war against the infidels, this kind of intolerance that is rooted in Islam. And uh, I was being countered by people who were not raised in the religion of Islam, but many of them were atheists, who were saying, oh, it has nothing to do with that. It's just that these people are you know, poor, uh, they don't speak the language, they feel disenfranchised and they feel angry and that they're acting out. And so that thesis, as you can see, turned out to be completely wrong. Uh, and it wasn't, by the way, these, this situation was not unique to the Netherlands. Uh, we have it right here in the United States of America. I don't know how all the students who are my audience right now are, but there was this uh, outfit called ISIS uh, that started to invoke again uh, pure doctrinal um, Islamic tenets to establish what they thought of as a state. We've seen where that went. And again, sometime last week, the president of France, uh, and he's not the vast national leader, but one yet another national leader, who's decrying Islamic, what he calls Islamic separatism. So the problem is there and it's big, um, yeah. but it hasn't, you know, uh, I hope that Theo van Gogh didn't die in vain and that, you know, the wider society uh, really comes to approach this with the realism that we need to, uh, to approach it with. Because you can't develop proper policies unless you define the problem as clearly as possible. And the biggest criticism for me with all of these uh, governments was the refusal to define the problem. You, of course, also addressed these uh, policies and problems, especially uh, during your time in parliament. Uh, but you've already left parliament for 14 years already. We um, yeah, were quite amazed by that, actually. So we would like to talk a little bit about what happened in those 14 years. We will not get into too many details because you just uh, mentioned that you didn't um, follow Dutch politics as much anymore as when you still live in the, in the Netherlands. Um, now let's start with two politicians that like you have their origins at the social democratic PVDA. Uh, you eventually went to the liberal conservative PVD, which you started first at this Labour Party. Um, Tuna Hankuzu and Seljuk Öster. And based on the statement that you made in a human documentary, uh, that Kuzo has to bugger off to Turkey as he is more faithful to the autocratic tendencies of Erdogan than to the Dutch rule of law, we can uh, conclude that you are not a big fan of these guys. So how is it possible that people with such divergent views can be can have their roots in the same party? Well, I think there's this saying, and I am paraphrasing, but I'm sure I'm not saying it the right way, which is uh, uh, if you are young and you don't have a heart, uh, and if you are older and you don't have a head, you know, both times you are kind of dumb. So when you're young, you're expected to have a heart and be romantic and think of the world through uh, the prism of, uh, I would say, center left in my case, mm -hmm. and think you can fix these social problems uh, with the help of government. And then as you get older, you realize, well, maybe somewhere along the way, we should also emphasize individual responsibility. 
which is what uh, the motto of the VVD is. Not its official motto, but it's pretty much what attracted me to the VVD was that we are going to have to start talking to people about their individual responsibility. Now, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing. I think if you look at the history of the Social Democratic Party in the Netherlands uh, before 1989, it's something that I, can, I still think of as uh, incredibly historic and, uh, uh, and they've achieved quite uh, some remarkable uh, things for Dutch society as have other social democratic parties. The classical liberal parties like um, the VVD, uh, I still think of myself as a classical liberal, is that you know at some point you grow up and this is, you, yeah, you realize that money doesn't grow on trees, you realize that other people can't solve your problems, you realize that maybe some of these individual freedoms that we talk about and take for granted uh, should actually be taught and people should be inculcated into understanding what these freedoms are all about, what they mean, how people fought for them. So I, 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 I can't explain why other people left their parties and moved, but for me, this is, this is my explanation. Now, it's actually quite interesting that you uh, mentioned liberalism because the VVD is not the only party in parliament uh, that considers itself as liberal. Uh, there's another one, D66. But the way in which they try to achieve their goals, uh, let's say getting as many equal rights and freedoms for all possible, uh, the means that they use for that is very different compared to the VVD. Uh, Dave, for instance, are in favor of diversity quota. So in your case, what you said at the end of equal rights and freedoms uh, justifies the, the means for instance, uh, yeah, diversity quota. You know, I know that a lot of people with, within D66 will get offended and a lot of people within the VVD will get offended. But I will say when I was serving in parliament, these parties in terms of their philosophies and what they wanted, the outcomes that they wanted were very similar. In fact, uh, after Wim Kok left office, even if the Partei van der Arbeid, uh, the Social Democratic Party, it, which they called the, the coalition that was called the Purple Parcel Cabinet, it, it just illustrated how <coughs> similar uh, these parties and have become and how, um, again, no offense intended, I'm trying to use my words as carefully as possible. <laughs> but some of the disagreements we had were really cosmetic. Uh, people, when you were just walking around the corridors of parliament, we pretty much agreed. So all those radical differences of, say, 50 years ago or 100 years ago had disappeared because most of the activism from the left had been achieved. We had a great welfare state. We had freedom. We had equality. We have, I mean, you live in the Netherlands. You, you live it every day. So when problems get big social problems get resolved uh, but the, the parties and the institutions are still in place it seems at times as if they're actually inventing problems uh, so that the disagreements and the, and the differences can remain but there really was no meaningful difference uh, when I was serving maybe things have changed now with the large numbers of immigrants that are unassimilated and the different approaches that people are putting forward and of course, one, one main difference between these parties is that D66 is in favor of diversity, whereas the VVD, uh, well, it's quite obviously not, right? So what would you say? So what, what is do you D66 think about? in favor of? Of diversity quota. Quota. Um, diversity quota. Yeah, obviously yeah. the VVD will not be in favor of diversity quotas. Anything that reeks of quotas uh, takes you straight into these collectivist notions. And so, I, I, I mean, I understand that D66 will, and this is what you're saying things like this in America, it's just idiotic. Uh, drawing up these um, collectives, you know, quarter here and a quarter there, uh, it, it, it doesn't, I mean, look at the empirical evidence of the last, what, 50 or so years, where they had affirmative action here and they drew up these quarters and the results are just really, I mean, nothing to write home about. So I understand why the VVD is not for quotas. Um, I also think maybe it's a little bit of a political cynicism on the part of D66 to come up with these 
uh, these symbolic, if you want to, symbolic ideas uh, in order to gain votes. Okay. Um, now, another tendency that we've seen in the past 15 years in the Netherlands in Dutch politics is the growth of uh, populist parties. Yeah. Beginning when you left parliament, actually, uh, Geert Wilders, where this PVD came up, and only a couple of years ago, Jerry Baudet, Forum uh, for Democracy. Um, they have won in several elections, and they might have not have become the biggest, but they at least won several seats in uh, many different elections. Would you say that these parties are successful means against the political Islam? They're channeling the sentiment of the voters, right? So when established parties like the VVD, Partij van de Arbeid, when they fail to address these new problems, and these are social problems, they're very difficult to address, but when they fail to do that, or when, they, or when they're perceived to fail to do it, that is where, when there is an opening, for other parties. Now, people like to use the word populism, but in a democracy, every party is populist. You're trying to get the popular vote. And so uh, you, you are trying to pander to uh, the voters and whatever the voter thinks is on the top of their agenda. And if you look at some of the success of the new, uh, relatively new populist parties, it is almost always immigration, Islam, um, the democrat deficit within the EU. Uh, I've been following, I'm married to a British man, so I've been, I followed uh, the, uh, the whole Brexit drama very closely. What the voters want is what is represented by either the new parties or the new one issue uh, referendum movements. Um, so th that's really where you, that it all boils down to what is it that the established parties are doing, what is it that they're failing to do, or failing to see. Uh, when Fritz Volkerstein was leader of the VVD, um, he decided he was going to take in the issue of Islam and immigration and the populist parties evaporated. So, and it's not the only place, anywhere where you see the established parties come in and address what the, the voters are worried about, the, uh, the populist parties disappear. The one issue part is disappear because if the issue is addressed, then what is the right to their existence? What's you the said and, uh, that, that the traditional parties could fill the gap, populist parties at some point. And is that a tendency that you encourage? I am uh, pretty, very much uh, a proponent of using what you call the traditional parties or the well-established parties because they have the infrastructure, they have the resources, they have the institutional memory so I'm a proponent of uh, reforming established parties rather than having these amateur uh, individuals and groups come in and then they, they aren't able to form governments, they don't have the resources, they get into this infighting, which you're very much familiar with, that really distracts from the problems that they said they were going to resolve. But my compliment to the uh, new parties and the new individuals is it is the peaceful channeling of the sentiments of the voter. And so you have to realize in, instead of taking up weapons and arms against the establishment and against politicians and institutions, instead of crying, let's dismantle them, uh, you're going to work within the system to say, this is, uh, these are very important agenda points that have to be addressed. Okay, well, thank you. We would, um, we would like to move on to uh, some specific policies. And then mainly in the Burka ban, which is a ban um, that started um, in August, 1st of August in 2019. And it prohibits everyone from wearing a burqa or a niqab in public transport, schools, hospitals, or other uh, government buildings. The main argument for this ban was the duty of self identification, but yeah. the major alternative argument is that these garments are uh, seen as repressive to women. Do you think this is an effective measure by the Dutch government to emancipate women? So the burqa ban in the Netherlands and elsewhere, everywhere where it starts to come up as uh, it, it enters the national debate is almost always about national security. It's sort of mentioned as a side item, the emancipation of women, but you can't really 
have an emancipation of women that is top down, that's led by the government. You can't force women uh, to dress the way the government wants them to dress. That, that would not be the right thing to do. As you know, that's immoral and it's illiberal. So when it comes to national security, uh, face coverings are regarded as a liability. Well, until the pandemic came along and now we all have to cover our faces. Um, but aside from the national security argument, if you want to get into the uh, women's emancipation argument, that is then to have a discussion, not led by the government, but led by civil society, on what it is that this garment symbolizes. And what it symbolizes is women have to cover their bodies so that men don't get sexually aroused. In other words, you put the sexual responsibility of men on the shoulders of women they have to be covered up and they have to get out of view. They have to stay in their homes and be locked up and all that. So once you have that discussion on the level of civil society, then I think the needle might move to a place where if then women, those who rebel against that idea and decide to take the burqa off and decide to take the headscarf off and dress as they please, uh, those women will then have to be protected by the government because then that is a law and order issue. If I take my burqa off and my father comes to beat me up or threatens to kill me, then I should be able to call the police and the police should be able to protect me. That is the way I would have this discussion. Uh, then for the national security issues, that's, uh, you know, it's a different policy and it's a different approach. Because when, when you're arguing for national security, um, a lot of counter arguments that have been raised are that there's only an estimate of around 100 to max 400 women in the Netherlands that actually wear these garments. And some people might even say, well, if you wear like a scarf in the winter, as you said, the Netherlands is a cold country. Yeah. And people are also not, they cannot be identified in public spaces. So how would you, how do you view these counter arguments? Uh, it's well, again, the national security argument is a different one. I mean, it's still, the jihadi threat is real. We've had men put on the burqa and try and uh, get into spaces that they wanted to cause mayhem. So when you have that kind of, uh, you have that kind of a, of a problem, uh, I think then you're going to demand that no one covers their face. I mean, everybody should be identifiable. I've also had discussions on issues such as you know, you should, we should be able to see your face just as a matter of courtesy. Uh, if you, uh, there were schools in some of these European countries where the teachers were showing up in full burqa, face covered and all. And, you know, how on earth can you, uh, can you have any kind of communication with someone who comes in in such a fashion? But these are cultural, normal, uh, and I'd say normative uh, discussions they're healthy to have. I personally don't think it's something that the government can and should enforce. I think every institution should decide for itself. So some schools will say uh, you can't wear the cross or, or we, we, we won't tolerate any kind of uh, ostentatious uh, uh, religious symbols. I think that's up to the institutions to decide. And if I were, if I worked in such an institution, I'd probably support that. Um, but again, it's not something that the government can legislate. The government can't tell us what we can and can't wear. Um, and it shouldn't do that. Okay, thank you. Um, we would like to move on to the next step in your life, which was moving to the US. Because in 2006, you left uh, the Netherlands for the US and you are currently working at the Uber Institution in California. We were wondering, does, does America feel like home? Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I have actually adapted very, very well here. Uh, I also live in the state of California where the weather is um, completely, I mean, it was invented for me, I think. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really been very, very easy to, uh, to adapt uh, to American life. Now, there are some things that make me frown once in a while and think, oh, and I, I even say it to myself in Dutch, 
when I hear some of the things that are said here and I go, blah, like, <laughs> but, and it's you know these issues of cancel culture and wokeism and that sort of thing i just share just think this is just so ridiculous um but aside from that on a personal level it's really been very easy for me to adapt that's nice to hear it feels um, good. We, we were also wondering like you already touched on some subjects already but what do you think if you would pinpoint it is the biggest political or social difference between the Netherlands and the US? The, the biggest political difference? Well, the system in the Netherlands is set up for consensus. Uh, I, I, you're all familiar with the phrase the Polder model, and the system in America is set up for conflict. And so there are times when you think uh, in America, everything is going to come crashing down. But then when I pick up some of the historical works, I find that actually it's always been like this from the time it was founded until now, America's been just this polarized. And, uh, you know, they have these dramatic ways of confronting one another and the uh, outlandish uh, views and hyperbole uh, of language, you know, everything is a catastrophe. It's all superlatives. Uh, so it's if you're new and if you come from the Netherlands where you've been told, you know, you have to you've got to reach for understatements and you've got to reach for compromise. At, at first, it can be shocking. But I think what exaggerates even a conflict model like the United States one, it's social media, because apparently very often people were just able to ignore what was going on in Washington and go about their lives. And now you can't, it's in your smartphone every second, every minute of the day. Uh, and it looks like people are having more and more conversations in their homes, polarized conversations in their homes and very tense conversations in their homes about what's going on in Washington, about politics and about things that they really can't do much about. Yes, thank you. Um... When talking about, of course, American society and politics, I think one thing that we cannot overlook is the current uh, Black Lives Matter movement who, who claims that the U.S. is a full problem with racism. You disagree with this? Um, we quote you saying, what the media also does not tell you is that America is the best place on the planet to be Black, female, gay, trans, or whatever have you. We have our problems, problems and we should um, address those, but our society is far from racist. We were wondering how you could argue against racism in American system when we, for example, follow Sam Harris's argument on wealth inequality, showing that the medium white family has around a net worth of $170,000, while the medium black family only has a net worth of around $17,000. So again, the quote that you just put out that I think that's exactly how it is. We have our problems. I'm not denying that there are racial disparities. I'm not even denying that there is racism. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, if you look at the general uh, American public, we're talking about 350 million people. It is not like we were in the 1950s or the 1960s. Things have moved on and great achievements have been made. And when I listen to my fellow Black American citizens, when I talk about Black Americans, I'm not talking about immigrants like myself who are Black from Africa and the Caribbean and other places. I'm talking about the descendants of people who were brought here against their will. And my colleagues like Thomas Sowell and Shelby Steele, who actually lived through the era of segregation and have seen these huge achievements accomplished, they are saying, that you, it is not, you're not doing black families and black people any kind of service if you explain these racial disparities only through the prism of power and racism. It's just not true. There are other variables at work. Uh, Jason Riley, who writes for the Wall Street Journal, um, he, he talks, he's written a book on social capital. Social capital you know, fathers taking responsibility for the children, uh, 
they make. <laughs> Um, the so, some of the things that go on within uh, black households, um, the failure of affirmative action. There are a few issues here that are so taboo that no one wants to talk about because it starts to get groups like Black Lives Matter completely outraged. And when I looked, when I go to the website of Black Lives Matter and I look at the policies, what they are trying to achieve, it's not about trying to improve the economic and social circumstances of Black people who are left behind. They want to dismantle the entire system. They are calling for Marxist ideas that are on the far left that will make the SPA in Holland look, uh, you know, look moderate. Uh, so it is, it, it's just, it, some of these things are really too complicated to uh, arrive at the conclusion that American society is hopelessly racist, uh, and, and that's just not the case. And I, I'll, I'll give you some other things to think about. Um, Nigerians who come here do better than whites. Indians who come here, you know, dark skin, some of them have darker skins than myself do extremely well economically, socially, politically. Uh, we have a half Indian woman running for uh, uh, vice president uh, as a candidate. Uh, we have Nikki Haley, who was uh, governor of North Carolina, now being uh, considered in 2024 as a presidential candidate. We've had Barack Obama, uh, who's uh, half black, black, whatever, however you want to call it, uh, be president for eight years. So this whole narrative that American uh, society is just racist and nothing else, it, it's just wrong. Um, yeah, it, I think it's, it's um, very complicated, of course, the, the, the current situation in the US. And, um, but I was wondering, because I think the Black Lives Matter movement itself really talks about these like structural problems that influence also the agency, something you also talked about that is a taboo to, to talk about. Right. But couldn't you say, for example, taking uh, Tahisi quote, quotes his... Uh, sorry, his... sorry, I, it's, you have to repeat that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I was wondering if we take different approaches to the problem of racism, seeing that there are structural issues such as uh, enormous an amount of black men in prison compared yes. to white men. It's very hard to distinguish if that is completely due to agency or completely due to structure. Yeah. So Black Lives Matter arguing for it, looking at the problems within structure doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing maybe. I think what Black Lives Matter have done is create awareness around these issues in a way that it has got everyone talking about it. I think that's a good thing. I also think more importantly than let us talk about what these institutions are doing wrong and how to reform these the institutions of law enforcement, for instance, the police, um, the prison system. Uh, we talk about the word reform. What are they doing wrong? How can we fix it? But if you go to the Black Lives Matter website, they're calling for defunding the police. So no more police whatsoever. Um, letting prisoners willy-nilly, prisoners who've killed people, willy-nilly out of prison. Maybe some of them are calling for also for the abolition of prisons. Uh, that sort of thing is not talking about reforming the system. It's talking about destroying the system. Um, now, of course, part of Black Lives Matter strategy is uh, what you already mentioned, uh, cancel culture. That's what you said on your website. Marxist views, and that that is what they want for the United States. Um, you have also signed a manifest against cancel culture. So could you explain to us why cancel culture is an issue exactly? Cancel culture is a, I would say it's a baby of postmodernism and postmodernist theories. Uh, so you're at the University of Amsterdam, I'm sure you're going to be introduced to many postmodernists, many of them very influential, like Michel Foucault. Um, but in any case, we do have um, 
a group of people in the United States who I think are a minority, but are quite loud, applying these postmodernist theories and calling out against social justice. And the way they're doing it is by claiming that the only relationship that's possible between human beings is through power. And there are those who have power, and there are those who don't, the oppressed ones. And you use the knowledge and language to fight for social justice and to fight against what they say is the oppressor structural. And we talked, we touched a little bit on Black Lives Matter. And I think the organization and the movement Black Lives Matter are applying some of these postmodernist theories. But one way they think that they can achieve this is by policing language. And so you can express yourself, you're a white man, Thais, you're heterosexual. So you're on top of the pyramid of the oppressor structure. And because the structure itself is racist, you are racist and you're socialized into racism. Now, if you say, I am not racist, that means you're displaying what Robin DiAngelo calls white fragility. So the fact that you deny it is for her proof that you are in fact racist. And people say things, uh, sometimes very innocent things, like uh, you could, I could get a compliment on how good my English is. That would be an expression of racism, but you're unconscious of it. This then can get to a level where you might write something or present a research paper, or if you're a professor, assign a certain book or a certain work and you could be completely cancelled. What to cancel means is not only that that particular class or book is cancelled, but that you lose your job, you lose your livelihood, and you become stamped with this terrible accusation that you're racist for the rest of your life. This was happening, I mean, I've been aware of it for quite a long time because I've been cancelled uh, on grounds of my Islamophobia. So when I criticize Islam, then I am told that I'm Islamophobic and my invitations to speak at universities and other places is rescinded. But now this has expanded into everywhere and you can be canceled for practically anything and you're not aware of it. And so it, it's, uh, I think of it as just uh, one of the worst ideological developments of my time aside from jihadism. Uh, and it's just going to lead to the closing of the mind of uh, people like you in liberal societies because you have one half of the population that is terrified to say anything or write anything or research anything. And you have the other half trying to impose these speech rules on them. And you can say if this goes on um, and if these council culture people get to achieve what they really want to, uh, it's going to be a big blow for free inquiry, uh, freedom of speech, uh, any kind of research. I mean, I've, I've followed conversations where people were talking very quietly about why is it that some ethnic minorities have uh, been hit harder by the COVID pandemic than others. And some of the researchers were saying that you can't possibly pose that question if you want to keep your career in academia. So it's just that bad right now. Why do you think that these people got so influential then? I guess because people weren't paying attention. I remember laughing it off, you know, when I first is, what was it, five years ago, when people were talking about safe spaces on our campuses and microaggressions, I just thought it was the most ridiculous thing. I thought, you know, these students, they're going to graduate, they'll get into the real world, and uh, they'll be whipped into shape by reality. But in fact, the opposite is happening. These kids who are indoctrinated in these universities, they go into uh, corporations, uh, they get uh, government positions, they go into the military, and it seems that they are spreading these ideas instead of these institutions molding them into reality. So I think it's something, it's now a big thing. Um, and the biggest thing, the, the thing that you see the most is the use of language. Uh, and how you have to keep on policing. You can't say this, you've got to say it that way. Uh, I told you about my Dutch publisher asking me, and I think it might have seeped into the Netherlands, asking me about whether she wanted me, she really consciously wanted me to use the word witte man of blanke man. 
and I remember thinking, oh my God, it's gone to Holland too. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely part of it. It's definitely part of this, this campus at this moment too. Um, so at the same time, you could also, of course, say that, that the reason why people do this is to make sure that other students um, are not getting offended. That is, of course, the, the, the main reason behind it. So making sure that people feel safe, which of course where the word safe space so comes from. Um, now, do you still hear me? I can hear you, yeah. yeah. Once in a while okay. you're falling so out. Where so the, where the word safe space is, like, comes from. Um, should a university balance the interests of freedom of speech on the one hand and making sure that people are not getting offended or at least feel safe and uh, feel that they are in a secure environment? Mm -hmm. It's the sacred duty of the university to offend a young mind, period. You go there to be offended. You're a child living with your parents until the end of high school. And then you go to university and it's the job of your professors to teach you how to think, not what to think. And the only way that you can actually have a valuable degree from a university at the end of it is that you've been introduced to as many ideas and as many concepts as possible, that you've learned to compare those ideas, that you were able to uh, judge these ideas you know, through the empirical merits, and that at the end of it, you are capable of thinking critically, that you're capable of exercising logic, that you're capable of pointing out fallacies, logical fallacies, in whatever field that you've chosen. If your professors haven't given you that, then they have failed you. If you want to go to a daycare center for older children, you always can. They can establish such institutions, but that is not the university. And I'm really grateful to my professors when I was at Leiden that they did exactly that to us. And I never felt unsafe and I don't remember anyone feeling unsafe. Now, if kids are being forced into doing things and they're physically harmed, that is one thing. But as far as I know, almost every university has some kind of, you know, psychologist or psychotherapist where you can go and visit and talk about your problems, uh, maybe problems that you're having with the pressure of studying on your own, maybe the pressure you're having with peers, uh, you know, being excluded or not, uh, or, you know, that sort of thing. Maybe uh, problems you're having with substance abuse, uh, but these are very, very different issues from you know, trying to get a student to understand what academic inquiry is. And so it's all about uh, what we call here academic freedom. And I think freedom of speech is something that the government can, can take. But this is about academic freedom um, and the quality of what you're taught and the ideas that you're introduced to. And the, all these safe spaces and microaggressions is just, it's pure nonsense. Thank you. There's actually one more development that we would like to discuss now that is happening in the United States, which is, of course, uh, the pres presidential elections that are coming. Now, you often appear on more conservative American channels like Fox News. Uh, pretty okay. recently, you were on the Tucker Carlson show, uh, and you told the host that Joe Biden was, quote, enforcing Sharia law by citing the Prophet Muhammad. Now, don't you think that these appearances and proclamations polarize American society even more? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not polarized. I'm of course, no one in America knows who I am. Well, very few people do. Um, when I think what we are seeing here is the, our media, our mainstream media have made up their minds about Trump and his administration, and they don't want to give him a second chance. Personally, I think the best way to deny President Trump a second chance, a second term, is to be just as critical of the other side and, and not to adopt one side. Because now there's this mentality um, that Trump is an underdog and uh, Biden is being protected. Um, now, given what I do, my work, which is when I see any kind of national leader um, be either co-opted or conned or maybe in a cynical way who thinks I can get these, the Muslim votes. So I'm going to say some of these things uh, that then later can be turned into policies. My job is to criticize that. And uh, I don't care if it is Biden or if it is Trump, 
if, if Trump were to say what Biden said, I would do the exact same thing. Now, why was I on Tucker Carlson and not on CNN? Because CNN is not going to have anything at this point that is criticizing the Biden-Harris ticket. And that's the reality we live in. We would now um, like to move on to your book, Heretic, Why Islam Needs Reformation Now. Um, the title kind of describes already what is in the book. Um, could you short, like very briefly summarize for us what this Islamic reform would entail? Well, it would entail that anybody who says to you, any Muslim individual or organization or even country that comes out and says, uh, we need to modify uh, Islamic doctrine or that we are going to moderate or uh, you know, modernize Islam, that they have to answer five questions. And that, that's, these are really the five big themes in the book. And the number one is the status of the Prophet Muhammad along with the Quran. As long as those are absolutist and you know, you can't argue with them, you can't see them in historical context, then I would say, well, then you're not really ready to go forward. Um, the second uh, is this body of law called Sharia, uh, Islamic law, again, which is black and white. And sometimes, sometimes it can get very detailed. Uh, this is what you may do, this is what you may not do. And if you do that, then you have, uh, there are all sorts of punishments that follow. There is a concept that is little known to uh, non-Muslims and it's called commanding right and forbidding wrong. And that is a horizontal relationship. What I mean is it's not top down, it's not from uh, the ruler to the ruled, but it is citizens uh, or subjects uh, from one to the other, which is to, if you are a Muslim and you see something wrong, or you see someone else doing something wrong, you have to denounce that if you can using your hand, meaning using violence. If you can't do that, then verbally tell that person to stop. And if you can't, then in thought. That is what President Biden was repeating, by the way. Mm -hmm. And that's why I had to call him out. <laughs> and, and then there is the concept of jihad. Um, and the concept of jihad is holy war uh, against the infidel. And I think as long as you have these, uh, if you don't ask these questions and people don't give you the answer, the logical answer, which flows out of that. And as long as these uh, tenets are in place and they're institutionalized and they're well-resourced, then we're not going to see any kind of reform or change. Reform meaning change. Yes, because you were, um, within your book, you also kind of argue for this more Western state, so the secular state that has legally doesn't discriminate and is tolerant. Um, and I was kind of wondering, why wouldn't you, because the five minutes you just named all are about the Islamic religion itself, yeah. but why wouldn't you distinguish between the role of the state and, for example, Sharia law and the religion of Islam within your criticism? Because the whole of the, in Islam, there is no separation of state and religion. And I think if you grow up as a Christian and in the Christian history, at some point, that separation actually happened. And in Islam, it hasn't happened. And, and by the way, there's a fifth component that I, I didn't describe, which is uh, life after death. And this, the life of the, this idea of, uh, if, you know, life on earth is just a temporary experience where you're supposed to behave in a certain way. And then after you die, you're going to get either rewards or punishments. Um, for a long time and for many people, that is a source of power. And I would say, if you, you know, if you really want, uh, Muslim communities and Muslim societies to achieve well-functioning nation states, then these religious dogmas, these religious uh, tenets um, have to be rejected. That's what it ultimately is going to boil down to. 
if you want to read the Quran, if you want to believe in life after death, it's all up to you, but you may not impose it on others. And the nation still has the monopoly of violence and it has the last word. If that can be achieved, then I would say it would be a great big step forward. Now, we've also asked our audience to uh, come up with some questions and one that popped out massively uh, also had to do with things, uh, with gender related things, with gender equality. So the question they asked was, how should equal rights between men and women be promoted on a global level? On a global level, yeah. <laughs> um, it's interesting that they're not saying how about in the Netherlands, <laughs> inside the Netherlands. Uh, well, on a global level, I think we've had a lot of, uh, there's a lot of material out there, literature, a lot of activism, um, you know, proposals to change legislation uh, around many countries in the world. But what it boils down to is to start opening um, education up for girls. I'm talking about the developing world now, because I assumed for some reason that this, this question pertains to the developing world. Send girls to school, let them stay in school, um, provide them with, I would say, um, proper sanitary uh, uh, services, uh, you know, uh, to be very specific. A lot of women in third world countries have no access to uh, sanitary towels and tampons, that sort of thing. Let these girls work. Some of them do, and they have started all sorts of small businesses. Let them keep the money that they make. Let them decide how many children they're going to have. Let them decide who they're going to have that, those children with. Um, that is, these are the, the, the first steps and everything I have said here, it collides with some cultural dogma, some cultural or religious dogma. And yeah, because if we then specifically look at the Islamic world, um, yeah. what tendency is the Islamic world moving to, in your opinion? Well, I've just been reading about uh, some of the developments in Saudi Arabia where women have just been allowed to drive, they're going to be allowed to work, they're going to be allowed to, you know, get some entertainment. Um, I think the Guardian... Uh, the institution, you know, you, you have as a woman a male guardian. You, you never, you never grow up. Um, that that is under discussion, or it's going to be dropped. If it is dropped uh, on a legislative uh, level, uh, still, uh, it, it's going to take some time before fathers and husbands think of their daughters and wives as free agents. So, it, I mean, changes are happening. It's too slow. Uh, and too painful to see, but, it, but they're happening. I think also globalization, a lot of people have decried globalization and they think it is the worst evil in the world. But in a way it has pushed some of these developing countries uh, on a, you know, it's put them on the path uh, faster uh, than if there was no, if, if there were no connections between the rest of the world. Um, I mean, if you ask me about women's rights, I'll say, look at the developed countries, look at a country like the Netherlands. Should we follow in the footsteps of the Netherlands? If you live in Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabis will argue, no, it's an evil country. Uh, but the more enlightened people will say, but look at the women, they're thriving, they're healthy, <laughs> they're still having babies. <laughs> yeah. Kind of so, ties into our next question, I think, what is, what about the Western world? Do you think that we established all possible human rights? No, no, we don't live in utopia. No, there, there are still all sorts of injustices against women in Western societies. Uh, the only thing I object to is when some women come out and say, oh, uh, you know, being a Republican woman in America is the same as uh, being a woman in Afghanistan. I think that's grotesque. And, you know, such statements are exaggerated. Um, I also think that now, now that we're having masses and masses of men coming, coming in from societies where women's rights are not respected, that uh, we are seeing these men then behave badly towards women in developed countries such as in Europe, and that these 
our governments are doing very little to protect the rights of women, very little. I'm not saying nothing, but very little. I'm also not very happy with a general feminism or maybe the disintegration, if you want to call it, of what we used to call feminism, where many feminists are becoming woke instead of really devoting their attention to in developed nations, maintaining what we've achieved and trying to fight for more. So yeah, gender equality is going to be, I think as long as there are men and women, we're going to have this conversation. So what do you think you can personally contribute? And maybe not, not you personally, but, but anyone personally? Well, to young men, I would say, you know, be chivalrous and respect uh, the rights and the freedoms of women. And I would also say something that a, current, a present day feminist would not say, which is protect them. I've read about incidents where girls are being attacked and young men are standing around. I would say, look, you've got to step in and, and protect them. Uh, and then for the for girls and women, I think we have to go back to our classical feminist roots where we say, this is, you have to make very specific what the problem is and what you would like to, to achieve. And in my next book, Pray, which is going to be published, you're going to see there are more and more attacks on girls and women in the public space. And so what this book is trying to say is we need to make the public space safe again for girls and women. And we need to demand that. That would be, in my view, uh, what a classical feminist would say and not this nonsense about, uh, you know, wokeism uh, and canceling people and what they call performative justice, which is nothing but just symbols. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for today's interview. Um, we have one final surprise before we end though, because the woman that has been uh, the reason why you became a member of parliament and who guided you through your political life has recorded one special video for you. Oh, sweet Nelly. <laughs> Dear Ayam, Surprise, surprise, special story, how we met. Unexpected, fascinating, challenging, proves your drive, your optimism, and your unlimited dreams from day one on were and are inspiring. You are unique, one of a kind. And I'm proud to have been of little help at crucial moments, but at the end of the day, you did it yourself, even catching your Prince Charm. I love you. Ah, sweet, so <laughs> sweet. Yeah, yeah it's sweet that as well. <laughs> and she's done more than a little. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for, for having been here today. And for our audience too, thank you for watching us.